welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and I'm excited to bring you another episode absolutely free. This episode is one of many released every month, totaling over 80 episodes so far. Each one is meticulously digitally restored and stored in the cloud for your convenience, a process that incurs costs. To help cover these expenses, you might hear some advertisements throughout the episode. While we do retain the original commercials for historical authenticity, you may also encounter modern ads, which help keep the lights on. If you prefer an ad-free experience, we offer a couple options. You can listen to the episodes on YouTube. You can also support us by becoming a patron on our Patreon page. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash donate. Again, otrwesterns.com slash donate. I do want to emphasize that we are committed to providing this content to you for free, but also we have to be transparent about the financial realities to bringing this to you. Now, let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Gunsmoke. Original air date is March 16th, 1958, and the title is Real Scent Sunny. Hope you enjoy. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Mr. Dillon, this old stove burns up cottonwood just as fast as those buffalo chips. Uh-huh. And like you don't know more than chuck in a couple of chunks and whoosh, there ain't nothing left but a handful of coals. Are you picking them up and measuring them, Chester? Well, no, sir. Of course not. That's just the way of talking. A handful means just enough to, well, see about as much as... Uh... As a handful. Yes, sir. That, that, that's right. Golly, we need a new stove anyway. This gall dang old relic's been here since the jail was built. All right, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll get a letter off to Washington right away. Oh, my, that'll do a lot of good. Why, them fellas back there don't even know there is any country west of the Mississippi River. You know, there are times I agree with them. <laughs> you just say that, but you don't mean it. I don't, huh? No, sir, you don't, Mr. Don. Why, the only way you'll ever leave Dodge City is for them to carry you out in a box, and even then you'll... <laughs> Put the lamp out, Chester. Yes, sir. Sounded like it come from across the street. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's standing over there by that horse. Yeah, there is. Yeah, don't stand in front of the window. Oh. Yeah. Stepping out into the light. Come on out, Marshal. And when you do, have your gun in your hand. Well, he's but just a boy, Mr. Dillon. That's a man-sized gun, though. You ever seen him before? No, sir. He ain't from Round Dodge. Quit hiding in there in the dark, Marshal. Come on out and fight. Now, that simpleton, he's standing right out there in the middle of the street in plain sight. Yeah, he's showing pretty poor sense. Here, take his rifle, Chester. Huh? Look, if I slip out the side way and draw his attention, get him turned around, you think you can shoot the gun out of his hand? Oh, my gracious. Well, can you do it? Well, but look here, and I suppose I was to miss and hit him. Well, if I face him, I'll probably have to kill him. Well, all right, then. I reckon I can do it. I can kindly steady the barrel on the windowsill here. Good. Now, you wait till he turns, huh? Yes, sir, I will.
What's the matter, Marshal? You too scared to come out? No. Where are you? The corner of the building. Huh? Over here. If you think you're... No, I can't. All right, Chester, come on out. My hand. Now, that was a real fool's truck you pulled, mister. And that was a sneaky one you pulled. You'd like to ruin my hand. I didn't hit him, did I, Mr. Dillon? No, you did fine, Chester. Well, I'm glad. Did somebody send you to do this? No. I just wanted to get me a lawman. Now, is the law after you for something? It is now, I reckon. Uh, Matt? Uh, Matt, are you, you all right there? Yeah, I'm all right, Doc. Yes, well, I brought my bag right along with it here. And a couple of blank coroner's reports, too, you know, just in case. Well, I don't guess you'll need them this time. You gonna lock me up? That's right. For what? Just talking? I didn't do nothing. You might do something, though, after you think things over. You might tell me who sent you to kill me. You can keep me in a cell forever and I won't tell. Forever's a long time, Sonny. Huh? How'd you know my name? Just never mind how. What's your last name? Sonny what? Sonny Garnet. Where are you from? Out west. Who are you traveling with? Who'd you come to Dodge with? I ain't telling. Well, then you did come with somebody. Who? Where are they now? Who put you up to this? I ain't going to tell you nothing. Okay. The jail's right ahead. Start walking. What do you think, Mr. Dillon? Well, I think we both better walk real careful, Chester. The kid missed, but his partner may not. Hello, this is Marvin Miller with another page from your American Heritage scrapbook. It was in 1854 that Cyrus West Field, a wealthy New York paper manufacturer, came out of voluntary retirement at the age of 35 to fulfill a dream and join the old world and the new with a transatlantic telegraph cable. The cable was to extend 2,300 miles from the coast of Ireland to the Canadian province of Newfoundland. The United States and Great Britain pooled their resources in the effort. The American warship Niagara was converted into a cable layer, and the British contributed and converted their ship, the Agamemnon. The cable used was flimsy by today's standards, just five-eighths of an inch in diameter, and it had to be laid on an ocean floor that was two and a half miles below the surface. Many heartbreaking failures plagued but did not discourage the effort, and after several unsuccessful attempts, the two ships rendezvoused once again in mid-Atlantic on July 29th, 1858. The cables on each ship were spliced together. The intricate paying-out machinery was set in motion, and as the cable began its descent to the ocean floor, the ships set their courses, one east, one west. The Niagara proceeded to Newfoundland without mishap. The Agamemnon was successful, too, after weathering a bad storm and the threatening cavortings of a playful whale. Cyrus Field's dream became a reality. Queen Victoria and President Buchanan exchanged greetings to inaugurate the new cable, which had cut communication time between the two countries from ten days to only minutes. Man was conquering distance and time. Cyrus Field proved it could be done with a cable that connected half the globe and formed a link in the growth of America through transportation and communication. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Chester. I'll open the door for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dillon. I just can't seem to get the knack of toting the tray. I just don't see how them waiters does it so easy. Well, it's practice, Chester. We just have to get some more prisoners for you to feed. One is just one too many, if you ask me. <laughs> Morning, Sonny. How do you feel? All right. I got some breakfast here for you. I ain't hungry. Set it inside on the floor, Chester. Yes, sir. And, and you better eat it, too. All the trouble I went to cooking it. I said I wasn't hungry. All right, leave it, then. You don't want it? You're going to get mighty hungry before the end of the week, though. You've got no right to hold me, Marshal. Oh, is that so? you got no reason to. Threatening to kill somebody's a pretty good reason. 
I didn't mean it. I was just joking. Joking? That's what I'm doing, too, Sonny, keeping you locked up. It's just a joke. Now, why don't we let your partner in on it so he can laugh, too? I got nothing to say. Where's he hiding out while you're doing his dirty work, huh? Is he in town? Or is he camped out on the prairie somewhere? I told you once... Why are you stringing along with a coward, Because Sonny? I wanted to prove I... Now, prove what? Prove that you're a man? By killing a marshal? I got nothing to say. Well, at least we know one thing now. He's an older man. He's probably wanted by the law. How do you know? Because that's the kind of talk every old outlaw uses on a kid when he gets a chance. When he feels himself slipping and starts to turn coward. Nate's not a coward. Oh? Nate who? I don't know any Nate. I don't know what you're talking about. Wouldn't be Nate Schuyler by any chance. How did you... <laughs> Nate Schuyler, huh? Yeah, I saw that name on the circulars, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, sure you have, Chester. He's wanted in a half a dozen states and territories for train robbery, bank holdups, murder. He killed a sheriff up in Montana only three or four months ago. He shot him in the back. That ain't so. Well, that's the way he operates. He gets the local law out of the way first, and then he moves in. Forevermore. So Dodge City's on his list, huh? And he's found himself a new easy mark. Is that right, Sonny? I don't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> you sure don't, Sonny. Or you wouldn't be here. I won't be for Oh, long. forget it. Nate's not going to try to get you out. You wait and see. <sighs> Lock the cell, Chester. Feel that sun, Mr. Dillon. I swear it's going to be spring now before we know it. Yeah, and then summer and fall. And the first thing you know, Chester, it's going to be winter again. It'll be cold as blazes. Oh, there you go, taking all the joy out of it. Matt! Oh, oh Matt! Wait! Wait! Hey, stars. Doc sure is in a lather about something. Look at him. Yeah, he probably got a hold of a bad bottle of corn liquor. <laughs> yeah, sure. Now, come on, Matt. Hurry up, though. I can show you right where you can put your hands on it. Oh, on who? That kid, Sonny Garnet. You've had a jailbreak and you don't even know it. Oh? Come on, come on, man. I know right where he is. I just saw him going to Wilbur Jonas's store. Well, all right, Doc. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's lucky for you. I happen to see him. You betcha. This way you can get him back. Nobody will even know he broke out. But come on, come on. Hurry up, hurry up. He isn't going to stay there forever, you know. Oh, I hope not, Doc. If he does, there wasn't much point in turning him loose. Well, turning him loose? Yeah, about three hours ago. I had a couple of boys keeping an eye on well, him. Well, what in the world you do that for? Well, I hope you might lead us to Nate Schuyler. Maybe he needs a little prod to start him moving. Oh, then I got my blood pressure all stirred up for nothing. It's good for you, Doc. Helps keep your heart beating. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to go back to my office. Oh, Marshal, I'm glad to see you. Uh, hello, Mr. Jonas. This young fellow was What's getting a bit... What's the idea, Marshal? The idea of what, Sonny? This man won't sell me nothing. No, that's not what I said, young fella. I just won't sell you a gun, that's all. You had no right to keep my gun, Marshal. And I've been to three places now, and none of them would sell me one. Now, what would you do with a gun if you had it, Sonny? You guess. I've already guessed. That's why nobody in town will do business with you. What's the matter? Are you scared to face me? Not particularly. You was last week. You were scared to come out in the street. You had your partner shoot at me through the window. You want to know something, Sonny? That's why you're still alive. <laughs> the way you tell it, Mitty. You see it different, do you? You wouldn't face me. That's enough for me. And Nate Schuyler won't face me. That's six of one, a half a dozen of another, isn't it? Nate would shoot you down before you could even move. Yeah, he might at that. If he was behind me, where he usually makes sure of being. That's a lie. You lawmen just make up them things. You give a dog a bad name and then hang him for it. 
That's what Nate tells you, huh? I know what I know, that's all. Then you'll probably know about his other partners. What you mean? Of course, they're dead now, most of them. Same story as yours, more or less. They took the chances and Nate took the money. More lies, that's all. Didn't he even tell you about their partner in Pueblo, the one he murdered? What you talking about? It was a bank holdup. As they started to leave, a guard shot Nate's partner. He hurt him bad so he couldn't ride. Well, Nate was afraid to leave him there, afraid he might talk and tell where he was heading, so he shot him to death in cold blood. He rode right on out of town. It worked real fine, too. Nate got clean away. I don't believe it. You know, Sonny, I don't much care what you believe. I've given you about all the chance I'm going to. Now, you ask Nate about it if you got the nerve. Come on, Chester. Mr. Jonas. Bye, Mark. I think I never heard that story before, Mr. Jones. Well, Nate Schuyler's that kind of a man. It could have happened. Hello again. This is Myron J. Bennett back with another little-known item of American military history. Not all the famous military sayings got said in the heat of battle, or even during a war, for that matter. And one peacetime remark not only made history in a different sort of way, but showed the stuff that army engineers are made of. The United States vitally needed the Panama Canal for strategic as well as commercial reasons. But like the French before them, the best American civilian engineers were getting no place with the big cut through Panama when President Theodore Roosevelt turned in desperation to the army in 1907. The man who got the job was Colonel George Washington Gothels of the Corps of Engineers. For over six rugged years, Gothels rode herd on the monumental task like a combination trail boss and military dictator, only to see a massive slide of mud and rock threaten the whole project at Cucaracha in 1913. But when one of his lieutenants threw up his hands and said, What do we do now? Gotho separated the men from the boys and spit his way into history with, Dig it out again. That's how he came to be known, as the man who stood up in Panama and the mountains stood aside. <laughs> something, Matt? What, Kitty? In the last 30 minutes, you've said exactly 12 words. You've been counting, have you? <laughs> Nothing else to do. I could get more conversation out of that stuffed moose head over the bar. Hey, what's bothering you, Matt? Nate Skyler? Yeah, some. It'd help a lot if I even know what he looked like. I had plenty of circlers on him, but no pictures. Oh. He could be any stranger on the street. I'd hoped that Sonny would panic and lead us to him, but I'm proud of him every way I know how. He just won't move. Oh, crazy kid. I put out word tonight that I'm going to get up a posse in the morning to cover the whole countryside, but he still keeps right on hanging around town. Matt, what gets into a boy like that and makes him so blind? Anybody can see Skylar's just using him. Oh, I don't know, Kitty. Let it happen, so. A young kid drifting around a loose, unsure of himself, wanting to grow into a man and... Not knowing how to. And then somebody like Skyler says, go kill yourself a lawman, boy. And that's the way. And the kid goes along like a sheep. Skyler ought to be hung. He probably will be if I ever find him. Well, maybe he's right here in town somewhere. I doubt it. Sonny doesn't act like he expects to run into him on the street. Of course, there's always a chance to get curious and come in to see what's going on. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Mr. Dillon, the kid's over at the livery stable saddling up his horse. Huh? Looks like he's fixing to ride out. Well, let's go find out. Take it easy, Chester. We've been following him too close. Well, he ain't the brightest boy in the world. He'd spot us. He's had six miles to do it in. There's no use pushing our luck. We'll just drop back a little. 
Hold up. Hold up. Well, that's one of the circle bar line cabins, Mr. Dillon. You reckon that's where he's heading? Well, he's riding right up to it. That cabin's empty this time of year. Hey, come on. We'll leave the horses here. I'll be clear. I wish that cussed moon wasn't so bright. Shh. Quiet. Hold it right there. Get your hands up. It's all right, Nate. It's just me, Sonny. Climb off on that horse. Come on up. All right, Nate. Take it easy, I'm Chester. I'm you up, kid. I heard talk the marshals throwed you in jail. Yeah. Caught you like a set and square, huh? After all that big talk of yours, how you was going to stand up and call him. I did call him, Nate. But he had his partner staked out on me. Yeah, sure he did. Then he caught you and spanked you and put you to bed without no supper. You just wait and see. I'm going back and get him. I just come for a gun. Won't nobody in town sell me one. They probably figure you're too young to pack one. Probably scared you to shoot yourself. You wait, you'll see. I'm going to step out and call I'm him, Chester. You'll you even you'll have see. the gumption to escape. Well, I didn't exactly escape. You're here, ain't you? The marshal turned me loose. You what? Turned me loose. You simple-minded halfwit. What all did you tell him? Oh, nothing. He just guessed it was you that sent me. I didn't tell him. Sure you told him. And he turned you loose so as he could bother you. All right, you. But Nate, what are you going to do? I'm going to put a bullet where your brain ought to be. Hold it, Skyler. Drop the gun. You're under arrest. I'll drop you, lawman. All right, come on, Chester. So that's what Nate Schuyler looked like. It, when he was alive, I mean. Yeah. Well. That Nate sure was a mean-looking man, Mr. Dillon. Had a face like a coyote. At least I'd teach that kid a lesson. I'm afraid it won't do him much good, Chester. Huh? He's dead, too. Smoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The script was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Meston. The music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns were by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Walsh speaking. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel by going to otrwesterns.com slash YouTube. And send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. You can call and leave us a voicemail, 707-986-8739. This episode is copyright under the attribution non-commercial share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and thanks for listening.